Greetings. This week's message is dedicated to a wonderful Christian brother who went to be with the Lord yesterday, Sunday, April 2nd. His name is Arthur. Um, When my wife and I and youngest son Noah decided to move to South Carolina, we've always been looking at the Columbia area. And for one reason is because of First Presbyterian Church of Columbia. It's a it's just, it's just a rich history, a solid church. Um, I kind of view it like what Tenth Presbyterian Church is to the north in Philadelphia, is what First Pres is to um, to the south. In other words, if you're just looking for a faithful uh, church where the Word of God is wonderfully proclaimed every week, um, th- this is the church. It's 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 just it's a solid church. And Arthur was probably one of the first men to really, like, so many kind people we met right away when we started coming to First Press. Um, and Arthur really kind of stood out as one who just warmly greeted us. We happened to uh, sit next to him. We happened to go to the same Sunday school class. And uh, just uh, a lovely man, warm embrace, lots of hugs, Um and Arthur loved First Pres. He loved the people of First Pres. He was excited when he became a member. Uh, he had started attending the church, I, I think, just you know, within a year or so before we started to attend a, a short period of time. But I just remember him telling me, "I've I've, be, I've become an official member." You know, Arthur was a, a man of prayer. Um, I know in Sunday school class he always prayed for the salvation of family members. And he prayed for the ministry of the vets, that uh, the veterans that he was uh, very much involved in here in the Lexington area. And he explained to me that uh, it was a ministry that uh, he'd been working for uh, for quite some time in different parts of South Carolina. So here's a, a Christian brother that just loves the Lord, very um, enthusiastically sharing the gospel. Uh, f- concerned about the souls of others, concerned about people that are being overlooked or the outcast, those that are in spiritual and physical needs. And and he was full all in to serve the Lord in such a way. He was excited. I remember at First Pres there was a, there's a mentorship program and he was going to be a, a mentor. I remember seeing him talking to one of the pastors and he was really excited about it. And yesterday... On April 2nd, he was at Sunday school class, which started at 10 in the morning. But um, shortly before that, as he was sitting with his class, um, my friend apparently um, suffered a heart attack. And um, within a short time after that, um, he yielded his spirit and, and went to heaven and is with Christ at this very moment. So, um, you know, when we lose friends and loved ones, you know, it, you know, we just have to be real about it, right? Um, I, I recognize him leaving this world as his gain because he's with Christ. Um, but it's also our loss. And uh, death is a reminder of sin because it is um, through sin that death came into this world. Uh, God is a God of life. And um, Christ came into this world um, in part to bring us life, right? To make us born again. Um, God, Christ came in this world to defeat the schemes of the devil. And one of those schemes is death. Uh, we, he- we know the promises of God in Revelation that he's going to make all things new. And that there will be a, a bodily resurrection. But I know my friend's soul is with Christ this very moment. As Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so author is in a place where there's love and joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Um, but we mourn, right? We, we, we mourn because of the, the effects of death. So um, while it was incredibly traumatic to have Arthur leave this world in such a way, um, in Sunday school class, lots of tears, Lots of watering eyes yesterday, you know, 
as the ambulance coming and the uh, sirens, alarms, and you know, and First Pres is a very large church, and you know, it was like everybody we just we just stopped, you know, and thought and prayed, and there was another brother who went home to glory. Um, I believe that actually same morning before church. So it's kind of good for us to take stock of where we're at. What is our spiritual state? Do we know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we born again like Arthur? Because we're not promised tomorrow. But I think the Lord, um, though I did not know Arthur um, incredibly well, um, it just always brought my joy, great joy to sit next to him in the church service and in Sunday school class and listen to what he had to share. And I'm going to miss him. But it's a goodbye for now. And I look forward to reaching the celestial city myself and, and seeing him and many others again and worshiping our Lord for all of eternity. Well, like I said, this message on Hal Harris is dedicated to my dear friend, Arthur. God bless. Greetings. This is the fourth message on the famous Welsh Calvinistic Methodist exhorter, Mr. Hal Harris, and we're looking at the salvation, his ministry, and his life. And this week, we're going to look at uh, the immediate challenge that came upon Mr. Harris after coming to faith in the Lord, um, the change of desires, and Christ's faithfulness. So where we left off last time is that um, Mr. Harris, uh, by God's gracious work in his soul, is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and he's a Christian. But immediately, there's a great challenge that comes upon him. Something that he has never experienced before. Oh, he's, there's been a spiritual battle in the soul before, certainly. In his rebellious days, God brought about conviction of sin. But the spiritual battle that's going on now, after, shortly after Mr. Harris coming to faith in Christ, something he's never experienced before. And, and what's happening is there's a bombardment of thoughts that are counter to the gospel, counter to the word of God, to God himself. And uh, so much so that this spiritual attack is, uh, Hal Harris says that life itself has become a burden to him because these, these thoughts that are contrary to the Bible, uh, to the ways of God, um, are coming with such force and power uh, to his mind. That's how he puts it. Such force and power to the mind. I think many Christians can can experience such things, even shortly after coming to faith in Christ. Yes, the, the devil's not going to stand for such things, right? The fiery darts of the devil. Well, he finds relief. Where? At the communion table. Because it causes him to look upon what Christ has accomplished for him at the cross. Yes. The Christian should always be looking at the cross. And so these thoughts that he was getting of, um, of like he, uh, his old desires of wanting to be praised by others, the you know as he puts it, the human applause, and um, and uh, wanting to live a, a carnal life, and wanting to be accepted by this world, well, those things were vanishing away. That's how he put it. They they, they had vanished from him. Actually. He doesn't say they were vanishing away. He said they were vanished. In other words, they were conquered. These sins were were, were taken care of that day, you know. And and though he didn't understand everything, he began to see the spiritual world. Though it was faint, you know, he he freely admitted that. He goes, you know, I'm ignorant to the ways of God, his word, about how he brings about salvation. Um, But he began to see the spiritual world. 
in in much more clearer terms than ever before. Um, And so as a result of that, he started seeing changes. And it was interesting to him that he knew that his sins were forgiven because of what Christ accomplished at the work, at the cross. And he didn't see anybody, other confessing Christians, speak that way. He was like, man, this is like either A, he is unorthodox, okay, or the Christian church or community around him, though they're very few in numbers, didn't seem to be quite right. <laughs> you know, he was like, hmm, you know, I, I, I see my sins. I see that I've been forgiven for my sins. Um, I see what my offenses are against God. And he just never really ran into people, you know, as he began to start reading his Bible and he's going, I, I just don't see these realities within um, within people that are involved in my life. And so that concerned him about the souls of others, that they too, even those that may consider themselves Christians who go to church weekly or at least frequently, um, perhaps uh, were not actually in Christ. The other thing too is, um, you know, he, he quotes here, just to tie his into this, that, you know, his desires changed and he felt as if as if he was a stranger because of the things that I mentioned. He said that uh, with uh, all of his heart, um, he was uh, turned against the visible things of this world to the invisible things. That he was going to pursue th- uh, of, of, of items that was much more valuable riches, eternal riches, and that, that he put his mind to it, and that his soul was at peace with God. And so he wasn't fearful of man anymore. He, he, it, was, it, was, it was as if God, uh, not if, but God brought illumination to him so he could actually see what's at stake. And all this is laying a foundation for him to become this famous preacher, that he knew that he needed to declare God's word in this very dark place where most people were ignorant of the of the Christian gospel and they didn't care. You, you know, you could say to such people, God loves you, and they shout back, I don't care. I'm quite happy, thank you very much. Leave me alone, you know. And then there are those that within the Christian church where it sees great apathy. Uh, it's, it, they're, they're in Christian in name only. And so God is laying a foundation here within this young man's soul to be a great preacher, to see the true spiritual challenge is what I'm saying. It's like a cancer, a pandemic that has just swarmed and, and it has uh, all of wells, you know, like the devil has all of wells in his grip, you know, and Hal Harris is seeing this for the very first time. He's seeing reality. He's seeing truth. Now, um, but he was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that the work of cross has, uh, that is, the penalty of sin has been dealt with at the, at the, at the cross, and that, um, and that he was going to pursue the richer things of Christ. And he also had concerns, though, again, because of the spiritual state that I'm describing, that he wanted to make sure that his faith did not become cold. He didn't want to become like what he was seeing with the church, surround, the, you know, the established church, the Church of England, where ministers sometimes wouldn't even show up on a Sunday, you know. And if they did, it was all very mechanical. Like, let's just get through the service so we can get on with our day, you know. There's no reverence. There was no preaching of God. It was just, it was. let's get through this routine here. It was dead. You know, you think about the scriptures where, you know, that you're, you know, you can say these things, you know, we can say things, wonderful things about the Lord with our mouth, but our heart is far from him. And God knows that. It's hypocrisy, right? Yeah, it's, it's because we're just pretending. We're just pretending. 
And Hal Harris, I think that's a good way of looking at it, was seeing a lot of pretending. Well, he did not want his soul to fall into such a state as that. And now here's what's interesting. Change of desires in Colossians, right? Paul says that we're going to put off certain things, right? Put off the former things and we're going to put on Christ, right? Which is these, we're going to be able to reflect God's goodness within our lives. And how Harris says that he, uh, that he was to take seriousness. So the sober mindedness, the seriousness over his spirit, that, um, that the old things that tempted him, uh, Idle words, foolish gestures, um, you know, just uh, 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 you know, any um, uh, any hatred within his own heart or malice towards others, things of that nature, or or arrogance or anything of that nature of the old self. He was putting, he was taking those things off. He was taking those things off, and he was going to be concerned about the way he spoke about people in private and in public. Yes, he was going to take seriously the, the condition of his spirit. And he was going to put off those old things. Malice, hatred, gossip, lying, you know, idle words, foolish gestures. Um, uh, he's going to put off the, you know, the things that belong to Adam. He's putting those things off. And he's putting on Christ. The, the, the love, the graciousness, the kindness, the mercy, the things that God is teaching him. Now, what I want to do now, the way I want to end this message, is by reading from you, reading to you, um, Hal Harris's own words. Okay? Now, this comes from June 18th, 1735. June 18th, 1735. Now, if you remember, uh, Hal Harris began to recognize that he's in trouble on March 30th of the same year. So we're you know almost three months into this story. And on March 30, if you remember, it was the parish minister who said to him, listen, if you're not fit for the communion table, you're not fit for the church, you're not fit for life, you're not fit for death. And those words God used to get Harris's attention. Now here we are, and, and he's, he's come to faith in Christ already, but Hal Harris, there's further illumination that he's learning about his salvation and this is from June 18th, 1735. And this is what Mr. Harris says. Being in secret prayer, I felt suddenly my heart melting within me like wax before the fire with love to God, my Savior. And also felt not only love, peace, but longing to be dissolved and to be with Christ. Then was a cry in my inmost soul, which I was totally unacquainted with before. Abba, Father, Abba, Father. I could not help calling God my Father. I knew that I was his child and that he loved me and heard me. My soul being filled and um, crying, thus enough, I am satisfied. Give me strength and I will follow thee through fire and water. I could say I was happy indeed. There was in me a well of water springing up to everlasting life. From John 4, 14, the love of God was shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Romans 5, 5. So what has happened? Well, this is called Christian assurance in its highest form. See, you could say many things. You could say, well, do you agree with the word of God? Yes, I do. Well, that's some level of assurance, isn't it? That's good. But you must not stop at that. Are you seeing God's work being manifested within your life? Like the fruits of the Spirit? Well, yes, I am. All right, good. That's, that's good assurance. But you must not stop at that. And this is Romans 8. Where the Spirit of God testifies with your spirit that you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to you. In other words, you cry out, as Paul puts it, Abba, Father. That the creator of heaven and earth is actually your heavenly Father. That's called Christian assurance. And that's really hard to get our mind wrapped around, right? As finite creatures? Yes, indeed. Well, 
Shortly after this, though, there was another challenge because Mr. Harris is waiting for word, if I'm understanding it correctly, from Oxford, the school, and anger has come within his heart. And immediately the devil is accusing him because he, um, uh, the, the devil says to him, look, you're not a Christian. You haven't changed. Here you are. You're angry. You have hatred for somebody. You're upset, right? Look at you, you phony, you hypocrite, right? And Hal Harris is back in despair now, you know, right? He's back in despair. And this is the resolution that he was to come to. This is what God taught him through that experience. And this is very important. So listen closely. He says, I was ready to be despondent, right? To fall into spiritual depression. But God pitied me and soon sent that word home to my soul. I change not. From Malachi 3, 6. I change not. So immediately the Spirit of God is sending word to Hal Harris' soul. I change not. The gods that um, pagans create are very precarious, right? When you look at the, the pagan gods of Rome, because they're a reflection of man. <laughs> so you and I are precarious. You and I struggle with our emotions, our thoughts, for many different reasons. Even physically can, can have a dramatic impact on our behavior. Okay? So when we're making up gods, when we're making up these idols in our lives, they're not real. Okay? They don't, they're not real. They're not there. All right? But it's just a reflection quite often of mankind. And mankind is precarious. Some days we're happy. Next days we could be an absolute villain. You know, and so therefore we make up gods that way. Well, the true living God who created heaven and earth, who sent his son, is not that way. <laughs> no, he's, he's consistent. <laughs> he's not complicated like you and I. God is holy. He's consistent. He's not precarious. And, and, and Hal Harris learns this. I change not. And furthermore, he says, that truth, um, that such word was scriptural, I knew not. And how to apply it to myself was at great um, at a great loss till light broke in upon my soul to show me that my salvation did not depend on my faithfulness but on the faithfulness of Jesus Christ therefore though I change yet because he changes not I was secure then I was entirely freed from all fears and found uninterrupted relief in the love and faithfulness of God, my Savior. Amen, amen, amen. So what did Hal Harris learn? He learned that God is not precarious, God does not change at all, and that his salvation did not rest at all on his works or his faithfulness, but on the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. And this is a lesson for you and I this very day. And this is why I think it's important to read Christian biographies and look back. Look back and listen to the Christians. Listen to the words of Hal Harris. Don't listen to me. Read your Bible, my friend. And, and let's go back and listen to faithful Christians. You know, the Spurgeons of the world, the Bunyans, the Lloyd-Jones, the Calvins, the Luthers, the Erskine brothers, so many, so many. They're, 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 just, they're just Christian treasures for us to enrich our soul and to bring clarity. Well, I hope this was some spiritual blessing. Until next time, grace upon grace be with you all. Thank you.